But Christmas Eve, 1914, just 100 years ago, the war to end all wars had degenerated into senseless slaughter, an endless network of trenches across the field of Flanders, Germans on one side, the British and the French on the other side, and as little as 60 yards separated these trenches. And in no man's land between these trenches lied human carcasses, carcasses of horses that were tangled up in barbed wire. World War I is a monument to human stupidity and barbarity. The Pope at the time, Pope Benedict XV, begged both sides to take Christmas Day and call it a truce just for that day, but both politicians and generals refused to do that. And as Christmas morning dawned in 1914, soldiers on both sides were weary, dispirited, and bogged down in their trenches. And then all of a sudden, something happened that for a brief moment stopped the war. There's a company in Europe that did a commercial just recently to commemorate the 100-year anniversary of Christmas Day, 1914. I want to show you that video, the commercial, and I want you to see how for a brief period of time, Christmas singing stopped a bloody war. Let's watch this video. got back to headquarters, generals on both sides were irate. 
angry orders were issued to restart the fighting. After all, nations don't pay and armed soldiers to sing Christmas carols with the enemy. But the Christmas spirit didn't die easily. So all these soldiers, when they were commanded to fire their weapons at each other, they did just as the commanders ordered, except they aimed high over the heads of the enemies who were now their friends. And for a few precious days in 1914, there were no deaths in the fields of Flander. At least in that part of Belgium, there was peace on earth in 1914. And then they got back to their business of killing each other in the name of God and in the name of country. Years later, there was a British rock band by the name of The Farm who wrote a song about that Christmas day. And one of the phrases of that song is gut-wrenching. It says, nothing learned and nothing gained. The war to end all wars didn't end all wars. Since World War I, we've had World War II, where there were 58 million people killed, followed by the Korean War, the Vietnam War, Persian Gulf War, Iraqi War, Afghanistan War, Cyber War, War on Terror, and now gang wars, just to name a few. The Scottish poet Frederick Neven comm commemorated the peace on Christmas Day 1914 in a poem called A Carol from Flanders, and he said, O ye who read this truthful rhyme, from Flanders kneel and say, God speed the time when every day shall be Christmas Day. Can every day be Christmas Day? Can every day be a day where there is peace? See, the season of Advent promises that there can be peace on earth, not just on battlefields, but also in every restless heart that we see and we experience. 700 years before Christ, the prophet Isaiah lived in a world that was the, on the brink of an Armageddon meltdown. But he foresaw the, um, the birth of the Prince of Peace and discovered secrets to peace. And he teaches us the final lesson of our Advent series that it is a peace that calms the restless heart. Isaiah stared out his window into the future and his heart unraveled. He had seen the Assyrian army invade northern Israel and destroy ten tribes of Israel, eliminate them, wipe them off the face of the earth in a heartbeat. And now they were moving south to destroy the remaining two tribes of Israel, Judah and Benjamin. He saw from his window the army, the Assyrian army, preparing for their final kill. And he saw his king, Hezekiah, lay prostrate before God and beg God for a miracle. And then to his amazement, God did perform a miracle. God sends a plague or a disease into the Assyrian army that decimated the entire army. God performs a miracle for his people. But no sooner had the Assyrian army limped back home before the Israelites forgot that God was good. Immorality and idolatry and injustice began to fill the streets of Israel again, and the prophet Isaiah was, Isaiah was sick with worry. And to make matters worse, there was now a new superpower that was arising. It was the nation of Babylon. And Hezekiah, in his pride, invites the Babylonians into his kingdom and shows them his treasure. And then God gives a frightening vision to Isaiah that uh, Hezekiah's greed at Babylon, Babylon will come and destroy Hezekiah and take all of his wealth and take it back to Babylon. The prophets saw the Holocaust come on Israel and the war that will plague the world until the Prince of Peace comes to put the government of the world upon his shoulders. See, it is in the advent of Christ that he sees the only hope, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. And in the 26th chapter of Isaiah, which we read, he wrote, writes a song, Isaiah writes a song, and this is what he says in praise to God in verse 3. He says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts, on you, trusts in you. Notice what Isaiah says. He says, peace is found in the mind. See, we think that peace is found in creating the right environment. We think that peace is the defi we define peace as the absence of conflict. If we can get out of a crazy situation, we can have peace. If we can get away from crazy people, we can get peace. But Isaiah lived in a high-anxiety world surrounded by crazy people. And yet he spoke of perfect peace 
for those whose minds were stayed on God. Ralph Waldo Elmerson said that nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Thomas Kempis said that first bring peace within yourself, and then you can bring peace to others. See, until Jesus comes to establish peace on earth, there will be no peace on earth. John Lennon of the Beatles sang it this way. Is, he said, all we're saying is to give peace a chance. But history bears sad witness to the fact that that is humanly impossible. Since 3600 B.C., there have only been 292 years without war on this earth. 15 years of war for every year of peace. And in that time, there have been 14,900 wars that have killed over 4 billion people. Philosopher Plato said, only the dead have seen the end to war. The half-brother of Jesus, James, asked the most perplexing question of all in James chapter 4. He says, what causes war and conflict among you? And he goes on to answer his own question. He says, it is the desire that rages within you. You want something and you don't get it, so you quarrel and you fight. And so whether that's in a playground fight to a global warfare, all conflict begins with our heart and the mind of a single individual. The comic character Pogo said it best. He said, we have met the enemy and he is us. Philippians 4, St. Paul Right, he says, speaks of a peace that will guard our hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. And he says, this peace that I'm talking about, this peace of God, passes all of our understanding. And after a life of conflict, Helen Keller, the blind writer Helen Keller wrote, said, I don't want a peace that passes all understanding. I want an understanding that brings peace. Can I suggest that maybe all of us do? And the prophet who introduces us to the Prince of Peace in our text gives us four truths to help us understand what peace is really about. See, this is critical because peace alone will calm the reckless heart. Number one, he reminds us that we have an unshakable city. We have an unshakable city. He begins verse one by saying this, in that day this song will be sung in Judah. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation with walls and bulwarks. See, every ancient city had an acropolis. An acropolis is a combination of two Greek words. It's a city on a hill. The people of old, they would build their cities at the front, at the foot of a high hill. And atop the hill, they will erect these fortresses, these wall barricades, so that when the enemies approached, the people would leave the valleys and run up to the hills and hide behind the walls of this fortress. They would shut tight the gates, and inside the walls they found safety, and inside the wall they found peace. Philippians 4, Paul speaks of a peace that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, and he's using a metaphor that the people understood, a wall that surrounds our heart. He's clear that wall is no one else but Jesus. He wraps himself around us, and dare anyone try to attack us, we are protected, we are safe. Isaiah is not speaking of a walled city made by human hands. Notice verse 1. It says, God makes salvation its walls. In the book of Hebrews, we, chapter 11, we learn about the patriarchs of our faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the people who loved God with all their hearts but wandered as nomads. They lived in flimsy tents out in the opens while the Canaanites and all their enemies lived in these walled cities. They lived in cities like Jericho. They probably felt vulnerable many times. In times of trouble, they were probably tempted to run behind the walls of these cities. But Hebrews 11.16 says an interesting statement that these guys were not looking for earthly cities, but they were looking for a better city, a city not made with human hands. See, the walls of Jericho eventually came tumbling down. Conquerors repeatedly ripped down the walls of Jerusalem. When modern artillery was invented, city walls seemed irrelevant now. We all need a city not made with human hands, but we need a city whose architect and builder is God. What is that city? Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 5 when he said to his disciples, he said, you are the light of the world. 
You are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. There it is, Acropolis, the city on a hill. We are that Acropolis, the church, the family of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ. In Christ, we're secure. In Christ, we're impregnable. In Christ, we're invincible. In Christ, we're unshakable. In Christ, when we are surrounded by Christ, there is no weapon that's formed against us that's going to prosper. In August 24th, 410, the Visigoths tore down the walls of Rome and sacked the city that stood invincible for over 800 years. And within months, chaos began to reign. The economy collapsed, and Europe began its descent into the Dark Ages. Panic-stricken Christians in North Africa ran to the bishop, St. Augustine. They didn't know how they were going to survive without the protection of Rome. And in response, St. Augustine wrote one of his masterpieces called The City of God. And he said to his parishioners, he said, your problem is that you are more a Roman then you are a follower of Jesus. And he went on to remind them that they were part of the city of God, the invincible city within the city of man. This is a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, the light of the world, the salt of the earth, the people whose citizenship is in heaven, the people who await their Savior from heaven, not just this year's political superstars and parties. Malcolm Mudridge was a communist and an atheist. He thought that peace depended on a political solution. And after he became a Christian, he said, I look now neither to the right or to the left, but I simply look above. Can I suggest to you that there are many of us that if we're honest, we're more American than we are Christians? We think that our answers are found in D.C. or in Austin, and we look for a Savior and a Redeemer there when our hope and our peace is only found in Jesus. See, our hope doesn't come from getting the right candidate into D.C. Every politician, every spouse, every church, and every earthly wall we hide behind will let us down. Jesus alone is our wall. He is what protects us. Verse 2 says, open the gates. Do you remember the words of Jesus? He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, he alone is the wall that surrounds us. He alone is the gate that you run through. And he alone is the perfect peace that guards you. Verse 3 says, minds that are steady on you. Thomas Melton said, we are not at peace with others because we're not at peace with ourselves. And we're not at peace with ourselves because we're not at peace with God. Have you found that strong city? Have you found safety and security in Jesus? Do you realize that because you belong to him, there is nothing that is going to hurt you? That you are safe, that you are secure, that you are in the hands of Almighty God. You belong to him. The Bible says not a hair on your head is going to fall off without him knowing. He says that nothing is going to happen to you unless he allows it. He is your wall. He is your protection. He is your shield. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to worry about. You have nothing to be anxious about. He surrounds you. Only there will you find peace of mind. Number two, we have an eternal rock. Verse four says, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself is a rock eternal. One of the disciples of Jesus was a man by the name of Simon who was a fisherman, a man without peace at all. If you remember his story, he was a man that was constantly getting into fights. One moment he was up, the next moment he was down. He had little peace with God, and he had very little peace with himself. One hour he was pulling a sword to protect Jesus, and just a few minutes later, he was denying Jesus to a servant girl. Simon had the stability of shifting stand, shifting sand. But one day, Jesus shows up to his disciples and asks them, he says, who do you say that I am? And the disciples begin to answer, and they begin to stumble around, and some of them said, oh, you, some people say you're Elijah, and others say you're John the Baptist that has come back to life. And in a moment of Holy Spirit inspiration, Simon blurts out, you're Christ. You're the son of the living God. 
Simon discovered the one Isaiah calls the eternal rock. And Jesus responds, says, you are Peter. And on this rock I will establish my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Simon's name now completely changes. He's now Petros. The word literally means rock or firm foundation. Simon, the one that used to shift, has now become Peter the rock. But you've got to be careful with the rest of that verse. Jesus says, on this rock I will establish my church. See, the medieval church said that St. Peter himself was the rock on which the church was built. But let's be honest, Peter, Peter, was, Peter was anything but a rock. No one would want to build a church or a life on his foundation. He wasn't perfect. No one would call him an eternal rock. A few days later, he denies Jesus three times. Years later, Paul will call him out publicly because he was a coward and a people pleaser. Thank God that the church is not built on Peter or any other pope or cardinal or priest or pastor or evangelist or rabbi or any other human individual that is built on Jesus. Others say that the church was built on Peter's faith. But that can't be true either. Peter's faith at times was amazing. But there were times when his faith was weak and even collapsed. He failed miserably. Guys, faith is critical. Without faith, there is no salvation. Without faith, we cannot please God. The righteous shall live by faith alone. But if our security is dependent on Peter's faith, if our security is dependent on our faith or anyone else's faith, we're not standing on what Isaiah calls the eternal rock. When Jesus says, I will establish on this rock, I will establish my church, he is pointing to himself. In another place, Isaiah calls Jesus the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, the baby who comes to Bethlehem is eternal and unchanging God. He is from everlasting to everlasting. So don't find your security in Peter. Don't find your security in a person. Don't find your security in a church. Don't find your security in your job. Don't find your security in your family. Don't find it in people or institutions or even in a church. The gateway to peace, the wall of peace that surrounds you with impregnable protection. The foundation on which we stand is no one else but Jesus. See, the only reason Simon can be called the rock is that because he stands on the rock eternal. Are you standing on a foundation that's secure? Is your hope, is your foundation built on Jesus? Or is it built on your future or your job or your spouse or your money or family or, or your reputation? What is your foundation built on? Only Jesus will never be shaken. Only Jesus is eternal. Only Jesus will be there today and tomorrow and every other tomorrow that the Lord gives you. Only Jesus. So if your foundation is being built on your job, can I tell you that it will disappoint you and one day it will fall under? If your foundation is being built on your reputation, can I tell you that one day it will get tarnished? If your foundation is built on your family, can I tell you that it's the people that are closest to you that often disappoint you the most? If your foundation is built on this church, can I tell you that we're not perfect, but the only thing that stands and is secure is Jesus. He is the wall that protects you, but he's also the rock that keeps you up. He is safe. Number three, we have level or straight paths. Verse 7 and verse 8 says, The path of the righteous is level. You make level the way of the righteous. And in the paths of your judgments, O Lord, we wait for you, your name and your remembrance. Over in Isaiah 40, Isaiah speaks another word, which is used by John the Baptist in the New Testament. He says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight a path in the, in the desert, a highway for our God. 
These are the words that John uses in the New Testament when he prepares the way for the Savior. See, both Isaiah and John the Baptist used a metaphor that was familiar with the people of that day. See, whenever a king would come riding in his chariot, messengers would go before him several days in advance. They would warn the villagers that the king was coming, but they would also straighten the path of any dangerous curves. They would fill potholes. They would level out bumps or high places. In the words of Isaiah, they would make the road level and smooth. Why? So that when the king came, the, char the chariots didn't face the danger of a sharp curve or go airborne when it hit a bump or hit a pothole. It would be a bad day for a person who put the king's comfort, safety, or life in danger. See, in the same way, we are to prepare our lives for the king to come in. Our lives were a desert of sin before the Lord Almighty, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, came into this world that first Christmas. And now he's come to us. We are to prepare a highway for our God to come into our lives. But Jesus is also a highway to take us to God. The verse I quoted earlier, Jesus said, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, there are a lot of ways that people think will lead us to God. But there are sharp curves, potholes, and pot bumps along the way. There's also a wide, easy road that leads to destruction. But Jesus is the level, righteous, smooth, straight path, according to Isaiah 26, 7, and 8. He's not only the wall that protects us. He's not only the gate that lets us in. He's not only the rock on which we stand. He is the road that takes us into the city of God. No wonder he brings peace and comfort to weary and frightened travelers. Finally, we have a destiny of peace. Verse 12 says, O Lord, you will ordain peace for us, for you have indeed done for us all of our works. I like the way the NIV translates this verse. It translates a little better. It says, Lord, you establish peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. Did you catch that? All that we have done, we have something to do. Our faith calls us to action. We have to take the right path. We have to go through the gate. We have to run behind the wall. Only then will we have a destiny and a life of peace. There can be no salvation unless we first put our trust in Him. We have to exercise faith. We have to take up the cross and follow him. Yet Isaiah says, all that we have accomplished, you have done for us. You see, we can see Jesus, but God first opened our blind eyes. We can hear the gospel, but God first unstopped our deaf ears. We feel a sense of the truth of the gospel, but God first takes away our heart of stone and replaces it with one that can feel the truth of his word. We come alive to spiritual things, but God first raised us from spiritual death. We repent, but it was God who first regenerated us. We exercise faith, but Scripture says that also is a gift from God. We love Him, but the only reason we love Him is because He first loved us. We serve Him, but the only reason we can serve Him is because He empowers us. We overcome, but the only reason we can overcome is because He overcame for us. Even peace is a fruit of the Spirit. Verse 12 says, Lord, You establish peace for us. All that we have done... All that we have accomplished, you have done it for us. There is nothing in which I can boast to say, I did this. There is nothing in which I could say, I found God. All that I have accomplished, God, you have done for us. Do you lack peace? Come to Jesus as your way. Go to him as your gate. Hide behind him as your wall of protection. Stand on him as the rock of your security. And ask him.
to give you the peace that passes all understanding. See, ultimately, peace, just like all the other things we looked at, is not a thing. It's a person. From first to last, it is Jesus. No wonder the prophet Isaiah will call him the Prince of Peace. In the beginning, we showed you a video of a war that was going on in 1914, and for a few moments, mortal enemies forgot all the reasons of their conflict and began to focus on the Prince of Peace. They remembered better days from childhood and began to sing a song that reminded them of Christmas at home. Quite by accident, they sang the words of Silent Night, and they began to focus on Jesus. And all of a sudden, peace began flooding into their souls. And that peace that began to flood their souls for a brief moment led to peace with their enemies. But it all started when they began to be reminded of their peace with God. Unfortunately, it didn't last long. Could the poet be right in his poem? Could every day be Christmas Day? Could what happened in Belgium take place in your home? It can, only if you find peace in Christ alone. See, this moment we come to the table, and the table commemorates to us that because he died, we can have peace. Because he gave his life, the world can collapse around us, but because our mind is stayed on him, we can have perfect peace. This morning as we come to the table, I invite you to examine your heart. What do you find to protect you? What is your wall? Do you find your safety and security in Jesus? What are you standing on? What is, what is your identity found in? Do you find your identity in your reputation? Do you find your identity in your job? Do you find your identity in what you do or who you know? Or do you find your identity in Christ? Do you, have you asked God to make straight the way, the path of your life? And do you realize that everything that you have, everything you have accomplished, he has done for you? See, this moment, morning, we should leave here rejoicing that when we were unable to do anything, he did everything for us. When we couldn't live the life we should have lived, he left the riches of heaven and lived that life for us and died the death that we should have died, took our place on the cross, paid our penalty, bore our sin, suffered the punishment that we should have suffered, all that we have accomplished, you have done for us. All that we have accomplished, you, God, have done for us. All that we have accomplished, you, God, have done for us. To him be glory, honor, praise, and worship this morning. I invite you this morning as you examine your hearts to come, grab the elements whenever you're ready, and we'll come and partake of the table together in a few